Hello and welcome to Skein Day Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram as Skein Day and I am Skein Day Knits as a designer on Ravelry. And Skein Day Knits is also the name of my Ravelry group. So you can join there if you want to take part in any knit alongs, uh, get help with patterns, uh, take part in the Skein Day Knits community basically. Uh, <laughs> So welcome to my knitting podcast, aka knitting talk show, where I sit and talk about knitting for about an hour every week. Although, as I seem to be commenting on every episode that it's been far from weekly, lately I'm just very busy writing my PhD thesis and life. So yeah, hi. Um, for returning viewers, you may notice something a little bit different. Um, I bought a toy. I guess. I mean, it's a camera that... Uh, <laughs> it's weird because I'm there. It used to be up there so I could like look at myself and the lens and see that everything's all right at the same time and I'm like... Yeah, I think it's fine. Looking at myself, I think it's okay. But if I fall out of focus and I don't notice now, you know why? I can't see anything and it's like a super cool like blurred background kind of lens although I'm actually too close to the background for it to have much of an effect uh I uh it, it has to be very far away for me to actually have a, this cut out so yeah that means that I can't see much detail either so you, again if it's out of focus it doesn't really it's not going to be something I'm going to notice. I don't know how much you care about this kind of stuff. I used to be like, I'm going to get into knitting in just a bit, don't you worry. Uh, I used to study photography for four years. I was super interested in it before then. And then I started studying psychology, basically. And then I started knitting. Um, I did that throughout uh, <laughs> knitting, I mean. And then now I just realised, well, you know what? I did four years of schooling. I should make use of it and fresh up my memory uh and plus my accountant's been like you need to have more expenses you're not you're gonna pay more tax than you should and i'm like okay challenge accepted so that's what's going on here so yeah i have a lot to talk about today that's exciting um I'm going to try to do that whilst getting used to this very new setup which may not look very different to you guys uh the lens might be noisy the focusing if it is i don't know what to do about that uh suggestions are obviously appreciated if that happens if it does i can't do anything about that in this episode but for future episodes uh i'll try to fix that and if it doesn't work i might just go back to the usual camera because there was nothing wrong with that for for the whole podcast setup it was mostly for photography that i was really struggling because if you don't know already uh, i am a knitwear designer and so I kind of started off really wanting it to just be the basics, like just as good as it needed to be. And it really doesn't have to be more than that. Like it doesn't have to have the professional photography and all that jazz. Like it really is fine if it's, if all you've got is your cell phone, right? Like that's, cell phones have really good cameras now. Uh, but personally, I just got to a point where I wasn't satisfied. Uh, just completely subjectively. I don't think anyone cared. I don't think like, fashion sales are going to differ based on I have a DSLR or a compact camera or a cell phone camera. I really don't think it matters. But for me, it just became quite obvious when the lovely Susan Crawford helped me photograph my host cardigan, you know, that cropped green lace cardigan. And the differences between the photos she took and the ones that I'd taken earlier with my compact camera I just knew I wanted that, you know, I wanted that DSLR thing, like, you know, the camera's only as good as the photographer, so I don't imagine, like, that's going to fix, you know, what, yeah, <laughs> but I think uh, it's something I was, uh, I'm feeling ready for, so whether this becomes the, the vlog camera or not, you know, it's not something I can say for sure, um, but I, I, I thought I'd try it, you know, um, it, it looks good, I'm looking at the, it's alright, it's not as, I think I have a lot more control over exposure than before, so you know all that fuss about the sun is going to be a bit less of a problem, so that's going to be nice. 
So you may already have seen some of the photos I've taken with the uh, Utra sweater. By the way, thank you guys so much for receiving that pattern so well. It's hanging right here behind me. You know, so that that was a bit of a hit. I I yeah, you guys really seem to like it. So thank you. I did. Uh, make a bit of a mess the last episode by saying that it wasn't out and then it was and then I added an audio recording saying that it was out and then I'm sure I hope it wasn't very confusing I just don't always know when I have time to put up an episode and have a pattern ready it used to be easier to have in sync in the past but obviously now that I am trying to amp up my photography a bit and I work with tech editors and it's just a bit more factors that need to all be aligned and it's not as easy as it used to be whilst also you know having a full-time study degree thing <laughs> so there might be a bit of that this week as well hopefully not but yeah I am going to be announcing some new patterns so stay tuned for that but I did just first of all just want to say thank you for really really being so very kind and generous about the Utra sweater it it trended on Ravelry do you see? Trended. And people have cast it on and a lot of people have taken this new construction method just in stride. Like, I, I'm just really pleased. I haven't had a single question about the construction at all. Uh, I put up a video, as you may have seen, because it's on YouTube as well, uh, basically showing what you do after you've done the short rows, which is pretty basic. Like, all you need to know is German short rows, which I will always link to it in the pattern. There will always, always be links to the the methods, if not in the actual pattern text, then in the abbreviations that I refer to. So that I'm never gonna leave you stranded about techniques I don't assume everyone knows, like knits and pearls, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, basically after you've just done basic German short rows back and forth to create a bit of a, a, a rise at the back, that's where the video picks up and tells you, okay, cast on stitches for the stick, for the arm, kind of go around there and pick up stitches for your from the initial cast on that you had so you can work the front from the cast on for the back basically that's what it tells you uh i faffed a lot about the the pickup of stitches because it's hard i make it harder than it needs to be because i think it makes it a bit sturdier and for me personally adding the factor of a crochet hook just makes it all a bit complicated but if you prefer using a crochet hook to pick up stitches a crochet hook to pick up the stitches. That's all fine. Um, I don't want anyone to be scared of trying this new method for a couple of reasons. One, I obviously want people to knit my patterns, but also think about it. There was a time when you did a raglan for the first time, if you have done it, I mean, you may not have, it's fine too. Uh, there was a time where, you know, you did a, a circle of yoke for the first time, and now maybe they aren't difficult for you anymore, maybe you haven't done them yet, but like assuming that you have, you probably don't think of them as very difficult now that you've done them. And that's going to be the case with every new method you try. And this one is not all that advanced. Like, I've done worse. <laughs> so, not worse, actually better, I think. More more advanced and it's... I love that challenge personally, but this one, I've quite... I've stripped down quite a bit compared to a pattern we're going to talk about in just a bit. So, that's kind of my approach there. Like, okay, it's going to be the first time you're doing this method you know, top down, drop sleeve, with steaks and doing it all in the round and short rows. So I'm just gonna help you a bit along with that with the video, but the video doesn't mean that it's harder, it's just, I wanna be helpful. <laughs> so yeah, that that's out there. Uh, I'm seeing just lots of people knitting in, they don't seem to have problems with it and it makes me so happy because I really do want to use this construction method a lot more. There's a lot of drop sleeve patterns out there uh, but the ones that are in colour work are usually either flat, which isn't really nice when you do colour work, it's so much harder to do tension, even if you like purling, which yeah, I don't, but if you do, it's still harder and yeah, so it makes sense to you know put in some steaks there and when that happens it's usually bottom up because it is such a faff to do the other way around but it's totally possible and that's kind of what I've tried to introduce. I may not be the first person but I've certainly not seen anyone do it before so I'm gonna just like you know well done me or something. <laughs> uh, so yeah let's move on I just want to say thank you and yeah so hmm Knit alongs. I, I keep forgetting the knit alongs I'm running. Let's talk about knit alongs for a bit. I will show you knitting. Hang in there. Just relax. 
having time off to knit and watch a podcast. Nobody's in a rush. I am running the year-long mitch along of 2019, where we aim to make six pairs of colorwork mittens for the duration of 2019. I am running the Cyber Mitting Club, the third edition, and probably the final edition. I can't remember if I've talked much about that on here. I don't think I'll be doing another Cyber Mitting Club. It's been really fun. It's been the thing that got me started. But how many times can you do it, really? Right. I feel like I've reached peak Sardvines. I feel like this is, this is it. So for future clubs, they will be different, basically. So I'm going to say. I have a, a plan of sorts, but I've, I've got nothing official yet. I need to obviously put in the work before I can say that that's what's going to happen. Uh, but yeah, as for Serbia Mittens, this is, this is probably it. So... And it's all happening now in case you just wanted to have one last chance to join in on that. That's, that's what's happening. And that's going to be running until the end of February. Whereas the year long mitt along ends at the end of the year. Uh, so there are some mittens that I think you could put all but the last pair of the January mittens into year long mitt along. Because obviously the January mittens will come out a bit too late. So that's that. Uh, but what I also want to say about the year long mitt along is whether to run that again. I've run it twice, it's really fun. I love doing it, it gets people knitting mittens, but I wonder if the people who wanted to try mittens have kind of done that and have that push. And maybe we can do another annual mitt along, not mitt along, knit along um, next year. I've been thinking maybe something more to do with my patterns. I try not to do that too much, like I've I, but I don't do it at all now, which is not entirely true because we're doing the course of the cal as well. But for most of the patterns that I release, I don't tend to host a cal because there will just be so many knit alongs to do then. Uh, so I thought maybe do one generic skein do a knit along or something along those lines, um, which arguably a knit along already is because I've got so many mitten patterns. But they weren't skein do exclusive. So I'm just t playing around with these ideas. I'm happy, I'm really happy to hear what you think. You can write about it in, I was in the comments here, but also in the the chatter thread in the knit along groups threads in my Ravelry group. Oh my god, I can't talk today. That's that's just great. It's kind of my one and only job on here. So, <laughs> so yeah, basically to summarise, just let me know how you feel about Mitch along versus maybe a Skander. I'm, not, I'm probably not going to do a generic Skander Mitch along, but something along those lines. And yeah, of course the Goff the Cow is going to end at the end of the year as well. It was supposed to end at the end of the summer, but it just so happens that we're running it for longer so people can finish. And a lot of people have asked me about mystery mittens. Will there be any? I really hope so, but I haven't designed any whilst recording this episode. I may just do it tonight, you know, if inspiration strikes. I'm not going to sell you guys a mystery pattern that you haven't seen before you buy it and it not being very good. So I will, it will depend on me actually having a good idea and a design that I am happy with. And right now I haven't even sat down to chart it. But once I do, it will happen. And maybe now it's a bit too late to have it done by Christmas the way we've done in the past. Maybe it will be a thing that you do throughout Christmas. If, again, happy to hear what you think about that. A bit, a bit more laid back than previously, just because I am awfully busy and I don't want to stress myself out with it. It's supposed to be fun, so yeah. Uh, and also, if I do do it, rest assured it's going to be with the usual, you know, Fienul, Ask, Tove, Navia, Duo, those suspects, you know, <laughs> there will be, I mean, you could use the Shetland yarns as well, um, Tukey wool fingering, that that kind of yarn, uh, that's probably not going to be a big surprise. If you want to get a couple of colours ready, just in case I come up with it, I don't know. Um, I'm going to try not to make them too colour dependent, but, you know, it's, it's probably good to have some kind of wintry or festive colours at hand, I don't know. So that's really all I have to say about that. I'm sorry it's just this vague. I wish I had something more precise to say about hey, what you're gonna do. So finally some knitting, you know, 15 minutes into the episode we can talk about some knitting. I have a pattern out! Yeah, should I put it on? I should put it on, shouldn't I? Ta-da! There we are. It is the Icelander. It is done. It's off the needles. I have so much ridiculous stuff to talk about this sweater but first I'm going to get up and show you. Yeah, so it's basically what that's all about. I think I should have just had it fit over actually. It's a bit difficult wearing it on top of a fairly sort of thick jumper 
but you know. Yeah, the back, as you do, it is, wow, this camera really zooms in, doesn't it? It's a fixed lens as well, so I can't zoom out. This is the, the hem. You can, of course, do the sweater longer as ever. I will always make things very adjustable lengthwise. That's kind of one of my pattern guarantees, if you will, that if you're shorter or longer, or taller, that's the word, or you simply just don't prefer cropped, then obviously my patterns will accommodate for that. So yeah, Icelander. It is really toasty today. I don't know why, because it doesn't look it. But it is, so I will take it off again, uh, <laughs> just to, you know, warm myself up even more every time I do stuff, because I want to show you some details of the sweater. So, anyway. So now I've demonstrated that it's pretty straightforward to take on and off, as the sweater would be. Uh, again, we can talk construction. There is two, there are two ways of doing this sweater. Both are very close to the author construction. So the first version that I did, which is version B, funnily enough, version A we'll get back to, but version, I can't talk, wow. Version B, you cast on for the length of the back, so from here to here, and work back and forth in short rows and color work. So yeah, it's a bit of purling in color work. I am sorry. What is very important when you purl in color work is obviously because you're working two yarns when you make a German short row, you have to make a double stitch for both the colors. So you make a double stitch for first where you're supposed to, and then when you work the other side of your work, as soon as the other color comes up, say you've done, I don't know, two black, two white, two black, two white, and you've made a German short row on two white, you turn, you knit the next white, and then next black, you also do a double stitch. That's basically it. Because if you don't, you're going to get a hole there. So you need to make a double stitch for every color. It's kind of like I did for the heel of the Yaltlan socks, if you remember that. Uh, so just important to know. You're going to realize once you're doing it, it's not really as complicated as things tend to sound when you say it in theory. Um, so you do that until you have, again, you know, a raised neck compared to the slope, the sort of where the shoulders drop up here. So why you see this kind of staircase effect of the color work here. It's a bit higher up here than further down. Then we pick up, uh, you know, you don't pick up, you, um, wow, cast on for the stick and again you come around and start picking up stitches for the front from the cast on and you go up to here. So I have to look at the camera uh, screen thing when I see, look at this. Um, and you cast on for a little stick here so that you can shape around the neckline around it. Um, so that means it sits a bit lower this one than the one of Ultra, though they're not that far apart actually. And yeah, and then you keep picking up further on and you work that back and forth as well so that you get that drop. Um, this will be across the steek so you don't do them separately the way you did with Ultra. And lastly another steek and you can work the entire thing in the round, all the colour works in the round from this point on, no more pearly and colour work. Promise you but I am realizing this is a rather more advanced version and maybe not everyone wants to do short rows and color work at the same time. I think if that's you, I made version A and version A is both easier and closer to the more traditional Icelander. So basically version A doesn't have this, this slope. It doesn't have any short rows. You basically work this completely straight so it will kind of have this shape. So just to show you, I happened to buy a more classic Icelander sweater when I was in Keswick. So this is a machine knitted sweater, which a lot of Norwegians have. And it's, um, we can talk about that a bit as well, actually. But I thought I would show you the difference. See, straight line from here to here. At least I think, it, yeah, it is. This would be an awful shame if what I said was wrong. So you can see here along the seam here, they're completely parallel for a straight shoulder. It's not actually how, you know, human anatomy is, but in it where you can get away with a lot of things. So that was, that's the traditional shaping. So that's version A and it will be easier. So if you are not um, comfortable with, I say comfortable. So if you haven't done German short rows before, or you haven't done color work before, 
I would go with version A. If you are comfortable with both German short rows and stranded color work, I don't see why you can't do the two together and do version B. But yeah, that's basically what I would make my choice based on. Uh, obviously, if you feel very strongly about this, this slope, that will yeah basically look like this um you can go either way like in norway we never really do this that shorter shaping most of the time anyway <laughs> so for a more norwegian silhouette you would actually do it quite straight so i just decided to give you that option basically uh so it's version a that i will be demonstrating in the tutorial video that i'm putting up i'm not going to do that for version b because it is too involved for me to take off the time but i i'm hopefully going to include uh, individualized charts for it which is going to be a pain but I've, I've already started so I might as well because <laughs> uh, I really want to help you guys as much as possible and even if you do need help I will start a thread in my Ravelry group where everyone can help each other out so I'm making it sound like it's going to be very difficult it's not at all and here's the the reason why I am choosing this method both with Uthra and for Icelander it's because once you are literally down here where my finger is it's so easy. It's the easiest pattern you could think of. You could bring it anywhere and knit it with friends on public, you know, transport, uh, sitting, walking, <laughs> if you do that. Uh, that's kind of my thinking with both this and Ultra. As soon as you've joined in the round, which is like, yeah, here, it's just smooth sailing. Uh, and that's kind of how I like to knit. I like to just get the difficult bits out of the way while I still have that. I just cast on mojo, you know, uh, while you still really want to do all the fun bits and you're really involved and it's not just like, oh, I gotta finish this thing too. Because I don't know about you, when, when my projects get complicated and I have to think, that's when I start putting it away. Especially if we're anywhere beyond the, beyond the kind of 50% progress mark. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's basically my kind of rationale with this method is just, I want this to be a comfortable knit. So just get the like assembly part done first instead of last, and then you don't have to think. So there, Icelander, for your enjoyment. Um, I'll put a little discount code down here for people who want to get the pattern now and support me in getting it visible on Ravelry and stuff like that. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, whilst that's on there, I am going to talk a bit about sleeves because that's the ridiculous reason why this pattern took me so long to finish. I started this in January and I was super confident it would be done by February so I can photograph it when I was home. And then it wasn't, so I thought, okay, well, I'll have it photographed when I'm in Edinburgh for the festival, the Arn Festival, not the other festival. <laughs> and so, you know, they, they got lots of nice of harbour stuff, and I thought it'd be a good background for this kind of sailor jumper, which is kind of the, the origin. But I didn't finish. I felt like the sleeve took forever and ever and ever. It took so long. So I let it go for half a year until I just recently picked it up and I was like, okay, I'll do the other sleeve, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And it took me a day. So I was like, hang on a minute, what did I do wrong with the first sleeve? And I looked at it and I had already taken out a chunk and grafted it because I decided to do it a bit longer for um, before starting to decrease to give a bit of arm room and I looked at it and I'm like this damn thing is like three inches too long <laughs> how it's no wonder it took too long so yeah that was me not the pattern it was all fine all my test knitters have had really successful sleeves just brain uh, so I basically took that sleeve off and took that Three, those three inches out, I just ripped them out and then I grafted the sleeve back on because we don't have more time. And they are exactly the same length now, happy to say, very appropriate arm length. It's all good. I'm just being ridiculous. I don't know what is wrong with me. This could have been out so much sooner had I just not. 
So I wanted to also talk a little bit about, you know, this being a traditional sweater and I'm clearly here pointing out the fact that there is already plenty of sweaters out there that looks like this. And a lot of people wonder, well, can you do that? How is that not plagiarizing? How is that not a ripoff? How are you being, you know, how is that okay? And this is where uh, a lot of these things with what is legal and what is ethical and to some extent moral in knitting design gets relevant and I, I like to think about these things a lot. I think they're very interesting and I think I have to know these things because I do what I do. And the number one thing to remember here is that this is public domain. This design, the Icelander, Islander as they're called in Norwegian, uh, nobody owns that design. So just because the major yarn companies have done their versions of that design, it doesn't mean that you can't do your version. And I hope I have shown to you now that I haven't just like put the chart on a, a sweater and called it mine. I have really tried to rethink a whole new construction method in order to justify and say that this is mine. This is my take. This is mine. Like I have given this a much more feminine fit, whereas this more classic store-bought sweater, which is really awesome. I think this particular one was made by Dala, but lots of mills and um, machine knitting sweater sellers <laughs> uh, have their versions. Um, is that it's quite chunky. It has massive sleeves. It's really, really thick and densely knitted. It's long, very long. It's kind of, I mean, it would fit a guy, really. It's supposed to fit, you know, pretty, you know, robust sailors. So, of course, uh, so that's the difference already there. Uh, the fact that they're usually also made bottom up, these sweaters, whereas I've gone top down and a different, you know, everything's all different really. So what makes it like okay and legal and whatever? Well, I have a couple of thoughts about that. Obviously nobody owns the designs, it's public domain, it's really important that big businesses with, you know, more fancy lawyers don't get to sit and own stuff that is public domain because it's something we have all inherited. Um, the other thing is the ethical concerns, which are the ones that I think is more interesting, to be honest. I think it's far more relevant to think, what are the consequences of me making an Icelander? Who am I competing with? Who's losing business if I put one out? And honestly, I can't really think of any. Like, I... So that's kind of my concern. Like, if another indie designer who was in exactly my position and doing sort of what I do in the places that I do with the same kind of audience, and they have done a top-down Icelander in a sort of comparable way to what I had done. Even if my numbers and maths and everything was different, I would have felt like I was kind of going into their territory and going, you know, you can buy my version too, wink wink. You know, that's the ethical concerns. Like, there's nothing illegal about doing that, but I would personally feel like I wasn't quite nice about that. Because it was clearly that person's idea to to do essentially what yeah um so that that's what i think i try to look at has anyone else taken icelander and done something along these lines because then it doesn't need to exist that's always what i i mean this should be every every designer's motivation is oh my god i have this idea and it doesn't exist and it needs to exist it's contributing with something new um so that's kind of why how I approach these things. I hope you find that interesting too. Uh, it's certainly kind of, and I, yeah, I hope it answers that question that I know a few people have had with regards to, well, I have, I already know about the Icelander. How can you make an Icelander? And it's like, think about what's legal to, you know, protect yourself and all that stuff, but also don't be mean to your colleagues, basically. So yeah, you can get yourself a strawboard Icelander, you can make your own, you can probably find a free pattern. But this one is pretty cool if you ask me. I think it's pretty neat. I'm very proud of it. I'm going to wear this a lot. So I hope you will enjoy that. Icelander. Icelander for the people. And why is it called an Icelander? I don't know. It was a sailor sweater. It's kind of like Norway's Aran jumper, basically, or the Gansey what sailors were, uh, people at sea. <laughs> so I don't think they have anything to do with Iceland. So that's why I went with this spelling uh, with an S instead of a C because I thought that's just not 
confuse any Icelandic people, <laughs> basically. So the other thing that I have been working on, which I haven't really talked about at all, is a little mitten collection. Uh, I actually started thinking about making it last year and it's a long time since I charted the patterns. But I thought, you know, it's, it's too late to release now, you know, it's going to be a thing that will be convenient for most people who are knitting gifts and stuff like that. And I thought, let's give people a bit more time and let's just have them out next year. So that's this year, right? And I thought, okay, I'll do it now. And I knitted them and then it's now almost December and I'm like, I can't wait until next year or a week from now even because I'm sure a lot of people are like really like panicking, you know, having their Christmas knits ready. Although more power to you if you don't do that. I mean, it's fine if you don't. I mean, just in case if you're one of those people that do and you said you're going to knit people gifts. Um, it would be really mean if I published them any closer to Christmas than I already um, so without further ado, I thought I'd show you the mittens. Um, this is really like a last minute effort now, even though they were done a while ago because I literally just blocked them. So they are still quite damp uh, on the blockers. So first mitten, this is a really fast one. Again, it looks really stiff because it's on the blocker. I just cut my blockers out in foam board. But obviously if you have slightly more environmental concerns you can just cut it out in cardboard and wrap it up in cling film. Basically just uh, put your hand on the foam board, trace it, then put your mitten on the foam board on top of that, trace it and then give yourself a bit of uh, leeway, what do you say? Oh there's a word for this in sewing. Allowance? See? Seam allowance. Seam allowance. Yeah, do that. So you want to have the mitten blocker as big as can be for, for your mitten. Then trim it down until it fits your mitten. And then that's that's fine, really. So that's how I do it. I think a, a self-made mitten blocker is actually better than a bought one because often the, the ones you buy are a bit too small and you just want one that will suit your hands and the mitten size that you made perfectly. So, yeah, this is what that looks like. Basically, I'll show you that. I don't know if it focuses. Um, I am so far away from the camera than I used to be, my goodness. So yeah, can't remember the names of them off the top of my head now. <laughs> they have all really cute names, but which is which? Oh, I should know the names of my babies, shouldn't I? So yeah, these are the first ones. They are all made out of vums and I think I used like six millimeter needles. They are quick. Um, so that's the, the first design. Second, I really like these and as you can see I used the leftover yarn from my Stonewood sweater. It was the exact same colours. So there. And the back side. Look at that. Look at that. I love that continuation. I will put that on all my mittens if I can help it, honestly. So there. I really like snow crystal. So just to kind of hold them side by side. And then we have these, it's a bit more classic Sarbu here. Um, it's kind of what they look like on the, the palm side. It's important to see the palm, obviously. You don't want to buy a mitt before you see the palm. And under the thumb, it's important. Um, so yeah, very snowy, very wintry, very cool colors. So there. And then we have these. These were the most fun to make, honestly. They, there was something intuitive about this pattern that just, whoop, I was done. The backside doesn't hurt either. Uh, this is the kind of side that of knitting if you don't get your color dominance right, which is something I rarely talk about, but if you don't, you're gonna get a line. So, I think it's even not color dominance here, it's just tension, isn't it? Oh well, I think it looks nice, but yeah. Um, Make sure you hold your contrast colour to the left. It doesn't matter what method you use. Drop a yarn and pick up the other or hold them in two hands or one hand. Just contrast colour to the left consistently. Anyway, didn't mean to scare you off by that. It's a really, really easy. Th these are probably the easiest ones of the all. They're really fun. Uh, and the last ones, I really like the design, but I'm not sure the colours I chose. They're really festive. And they remind me of this house that I lived next to growing up. 
but they look like their colors have bled because the red, the fuzz of the red is overlapping with the white. So the colors haven't bled at all. It just looks like it because it's just so fuzzy. Oh, the palm side of these. It just looks like it's dripping. I don't know what, yeah. So that's these, but yeah, so the colors, I, I mean, holding them side by side, I love them all. The colors of the last ones, I was like, mm, I want to see if I can do, <laughs> if I can do different colors. And in my brain, I thought, well, I just do a second mitten, you know, in, in smaller needles and thinner yarn. That'd be faster because smaller is faster, right? Even though it's the exact same pattern and the exact same stitch count and it makes no logical sense. And it's the, the cutest ornament mitten ever. <laughs> Look how little it is! It fits over two fingers, it's so small. Oh. Obviously, did not make this in Vams. I did this in Ulcentrum, which is actually my leftover yarn for the mittens that are coming in December. I have actually been in talks with Midwinter Yarns here in the UK, who I bought the yarn from back in 2016. Uh, and they will have the yarn, and they will. Unless you just want to use all the yarns, that's fine too. That's why I don't get sponsored most of the time. So I can just say, use whatever yarn you want, whatever is your budget, whatever is your availability. Oh, they're so small. Oh my god, I am losing it. This is like how re I react when I see like, you know, elephant babies and capybara babies and puppies. Uh, I'm gonna stop. This is very a lot. Um, so yeah, this, they're so small. As you can see, I am going to get up now. You can see that? Uh, did you hear that? Oh, focus is a bit loud, isn't it? And there's no gusset. I don't think a ornament mitten needs a gusset, right? You put a little snack in here or something. Uh, so you can obviously put in an afterthought thumb if you want to do that. But I thought, just leave it out. So... It's easier to knit these than the actual mittens, if you if that's a, an incentive, I don't know. I'm going to see if I can make more of these miniatures so I can show when putting the pattern up on Ravelry for people who don't watch the podcast. I know, weirdos, right? <laughs> and basically put in a bit of a recipe of this is how you can turn all of these mittens into a ornament. So uh, basically what you do, I can tell you now, for knit rows in garter you want to use like the small needles and I use the flaring a little bit but also I need to sew it together because it's worked flat to get two garter ridges and then you knit the first row of the pattern but um basically you just omit the gusset and continue on the pattern till the end of the the palm side and then you're doing the round and off you go no gusset no thumb nothing nothing like that <sighs> they're so cute they are, they are not blocked. I literally just made these now, which is kind of why I'm losing it. I was like, I'm just going to quickly knit them before I record. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And it didn't really took, take that long either. Clearly just did them in one sitting while watching Winter Sun videos, because that's a good band. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, they need blocking, clearly. Literally just bound them off. But yeah, so I guess what this is, is like a last minute Christmas knit collection or ornament collection, whatever floats you both. Uh, so you can do either. Uh, should I have done a full pair of each design? Yes, I should have. But if I do that, it's not going to be out in time. So yeah, uh, enjoy if that's this is your kappa. Um, where's the another oh, R5 here? <laughs> Help me. So let's do a... Let's do a photo for the for the podcast shot. I don't know. Hey, okay, cool. So five designs. I'm gonna hopefully have them out on Ravelry by the time this episode goes up. I don't see why not. I'm gonna do some photos in the afternoon. It will be all nice once once they're dry. <laughs> so yeah, enjoy. I am also gonna link to the the patterns that came out that I announced was out last week in case anyone has just no idea what I'm talking about. I always feel like I need to comment on this. I did not steal this mug from Starbucks. I know they're not for sale, 
but I was not the one who stole it. It was a flatmate of a previous flat chair who stole it. And when I used it, because it was part of the kitchen interior, she put up a note in the kitchen accusing someone of having stolen it and wanted it back. And I was like, girl, I'm just drinking from it. But fine, if you want it stolen, it's stolen. So I stole it from someone who stole it from Starbucks. So yeah, I mean, I guess we're going into finished objects now, which is where I have so much to talk about. Obviously, one of which is the Icelander. Uh, I realized I never mentioned the yarn I used. That's that's a bit irresponsible. Anyway, the yarn I used is Vilje by Hillesvog. What is exciting about this? Well, one, it's compatible with Sölje, so you can use Sölje if you want, and Sölje is just scrumptious yarn from Hillesvog. But you can use Spinul and the usual jazz. I'm going to link to a lot of yarn options. I'm sure, like, you know, whole super soft and picks palette works fine as well. Um, but yeah, the reason I am excited about Vilje is because they've just launched new colours. Three new colours, and they're all my favourite colours. Navy blue, bottle green, and burgundy red. I feel like maybe I mentioned that in the last episode as well, but it does not hurt repeating because, oh my days, I could get a burgundy Icelander. Mm. Oh yeah. I don't think I have much to say about it. I'm just really pleased that it's done, and I was just ridiculous when it came to the whole sleeve situation. And I actually like grafted on the sleeve twice. Uh, everything I do, but I mean, I should also explain the reason I did that is because I knitted one version of the sleeve, and I thought it could be improved upon. And then, being slightly weirdly perfectionist, sometimes I felt like the sweater I had made should look like the one in the pattern so it should have that better tapering of the decreases that I put into the pattern. Obviously also I want a sweater that's as good as it can be so <laughs> maybe slightly selfish reasons as well but yeah. Icelander finished object. Ooh. The other finished object that I am sure you guys thought I would never finish it's one of those old whips. It's from a year and a half ago. I think I started in February last year and I've had lots of questions about it. Oh, are you going to finish it soon? You were so close to being done and you were knitting it so fast and what happened to it? I just felt like picking it up the other day and finished it in two sittings. What took me so long? I know. I'm sure you want to know what it is. I'm sure you have a couple of guesses because there are a lot of options to guess from, let's be real, but is Klukka the whole damn thing look at that look at it okay this is going to be really hard to show in one piece with the new setup uh, I mean it wouldn't be any easier in the old setup honestly um, and I'm not putting this on because this is knit out of Icelandic wool and that's on warm stuff <laughs> so uh, this is the skirt it's very bell shaped thus the name it's the waist and the rib and that's where I left it off and stopped knitting on it and then I did the body super fast and it smells really nice because I put it in the wash yes Icelandic wool in the washer machine I do that I did that with Icelander too <sighs> most things can be put in the washing machine no matter what you think I don't the only stuff I don't put in the washing machine is hand dyed yarn that doesn't go in there because that's I've done that and I learned the hard way that we don't do that. The colours go everywhere. But this is Plutilope. It is unspun, arguably also unplied. I mean it is unplied as there's only one ply of unspun yarn. It's arguably not really yarn, it's roving. It's just pure fluff that is just in a strand. So that's roving. That you could spin. Or you can just knit with it and that's what I've done with this skirt. So the recommended yarn was Let Lopi, which is basically two strands of Plutilopi held together. But a single strand of Plutilopi knits up at the same gauge. So I thought, yeah, I'm doing that. And it's become the lightest dress you can imagine. It is so light for this massive piece of, of knitwear. So for me that matters a lot in terms of how much I can be bothered to wear it. Because, like, for instance, this, this store-bought Icelander is heavy. Like, this is a lot. And I don't, I can't always be bothered to wear this because it's going to be just, ugh, you know, I feel like I'm just 
loaded basically uh, I love it for those you know really cold days and I wore this so much in Keswick where it was cold and I sat outside I knitted and you know waved at the alpacas and all the, pe the peasants were well, pheasants there were so many pheasants in uh, the Lake District at the Derwent Water where we were at there's pheasants everywhere and it's a really nice knit but I have some gripe with it one uh, they want you to knit everything from the underarm flat and I'm like well that seems very unnecessary it's both the recommended yarn and the yarn I used is very steakable so I steaked it I had steaks for the armholes here and I had them for the front of the neck and I even have a tiny one for the back do you want to see it it's so tiny it's so tiny look at that <laughs> I could tack it down but it's not gonna go anywhere so I can see why they didn't do steaks because this is a little bit more likely to show on the outside given there are just straps but if I just trim this this bit here which I should have done it doesn't actually show right this, this that's the bit again so I'm not really too worried oh look how crisp my camera is look at that oh god now I can see how much my face looks like a pizza this week nobody needs to see that so yeah um, I would definitely recommend sticking this if you don't like purling, if you don't mind purling, it's not really going to matter. But I personally wasn't really feeling like purling in Plutilope because Plutilope being completely unspun is weak. Like you just, you can just do this. It breaks so much, if you just sit on the strand while you just pick up your knit, knitting project, it will break. Like it breaks all the time and equally it's bit splices so easily you don't actually really have to spit you just kind of like it just wants to stick to each other to it again like it, it's, it's not spun like it's just oh. so it's it's really nice to work with actually I really liked it even doing the ribbon I could do I was worried about purling with it because when you purl it tends to be a bit looser than knitting so you have to give the purl a bit of an extra tug at the end right to get it at the same tension as the knit stitch and that's usually when it can break, but it never happened for me. Yeah, sure, it broke a lot of times, but not when I was purling. So I guess I could have done the front flat if I wanted to. I just didn't. So, eh. Uh, also, not entirely sure about the crochet edges that you do. Uh, I did them, they're alright. Um, I just don't love them. I'm not sure this is something that... I mean, maybe a light cord would have been nicer, but I didn't do that. I did the crochet edge because I'm a good girl sometimes. So... This is what it looks like. And I have a bit of a gripe. Uh, I do really love this pattern. It's been the one that's been in my queue for the longest. I've had this in my queue since I got really into knitting. And I discovered Ravelry. It must have been 2012. It's been in my queue for a long time. And there is one thing that I am kind of makes me glad that I only did this now. Now that I know a lot more about designing because the size range of this pattern is almost an insult. I'm gonna get the book out and show you because it's just, I don't know what they were thinking. So this is the book I've got, Knitting with Icelandic Wool. I absolutely do recommend it even though the sizing of this dress, and it's really only the dress as, as I've noticed, it's just not quite right. Uh, this is the book that has, you know, the off to the sweater, the diddari, all of it. The book is amazing. Let me tell you a little bit about the sizes. Size small, 80 centimeters. I'm gonna go and say that's an extra small, but okay. Medium, 84. Large, 88. Now, now we're into small, if you ask me, but no, they're saying that's a large and a medium. Extra large, 93 centimeters. What on earth? Where is 93 centimeters a large? I am 105. I am seven centimeters more than this. And I, in the store, can buy a medium, but usually knitting, I have to go with a large. Uh, and, and sometimes go with extra large just because I like a bit of ease. Uh, it's just like, it, that's the max size. 
If you go a chest that's bigger than 93 centimeters, I'm gonna put this into Google so you get in inches. That is 36.6 inches. A large. I, mm, it's just, I mean, I don't, this is why I don't like the, these labels, the small, medium, large thing. I don't, I don't it just doesn't make any sense. Um, we can see and disagree about which is which a long time. It's not really very interesting either. What bothers me is that it only goes up to a 36 inch. That's the max size in this, this skirt. And that's why I'm really glad that I chose to knit it now because now I know how to grade it myself. And what I will say is actually it's not that hard. So even if you don't know a thing about grading, if you put down all the numbers of each of the sizes in a spreadsheet, just like anything, just like a grade your math book or whatever, you will see there's a system between them. For every size up, there is a, a difference in numbers. Just keep adding for every, you know, the skirt hem, the waist, uh, bust, all of that. Keep adding the same proportion. You can grade up yourself. They've used that system for this particular pattern. Um, and I did that and I did it for three more sizes before I finally found my size. Which to me, I mean, really goes to show that the problem here isn't just that the size range doesn't go very far, but is very close. All the sizes are very close to one another. And I think maybe that's where it just things went wrong because I, I don't really expect books like these to have a the kind of our size ranges that we can get from Indie Patterns on Ravelry. You don't get that. Um, but you do get them a bit further spread apart. So I think that's where it went wrong. Really, I don't think anyone thought, oh, we don't want anyone wearing this dress if they're more than 36 inches. Uh, <laughs> just I think they just they didn't space the sizes far enough apart so I still want to encourage people to just kind of take matters into your own hands you know don't I there's a lot of discussions around size inclusivity now again and I'm really here all for it as you know I've been talking about this for a long time and I yeah I also am maybe of the slightly less popular opinion that we can take matters into our own hands and empower ourselves with knowing what to do with a pattern that doesn't fit us Yes, be mindful where you put your money. Uh, if people don't want to grade for your size, then hell. Yeah. But, you know, let's not make ourselves dependent on who does what. Um, I want to empower people of different body sizes, the, from the very small to the very big, and all of our different proportions. And for this particular dress, I think that will be a very easy and a very sort of, yeah, maybe a good starting point even. I don't know. I was going to say a lot of things now and I forgot, so I'm going to put this back into my shelf. It's a good book, by the way. It's a really nice book. So yeah, I have a finished dress. I am not putting it on, but I haven't actually tried it even. I'm a little bit worried that maybe I have a different size than last year, but I'm also kind of lucky in the sense that when I do change size, actually it's just from waist down for me most of the time, so it should fit fine up here. Um, also, that's the bit I knitted more recently, so I know actually it would fit fine. But the skirt isn't as flary as, say, my little black skirt. You know, it's more of a bell shape rather than a half circle or a full circle. So, you can see it doesn't have those folds the way the little black skirt does. So, I'm not sure how much, like, wearable room there is. I, I sit with my legs crossed a lot and I'm not sure if it allows for that. Yeah, look at the colours. Also, I want to give a massive thanks to the lady who sent me this yarn. It, I think it was last Christmas. I just got sent a pile of Plotilope, which was super nice. So thank you so much. I do actually have one more finished object, and it is a coming design. Uh, the only reason it's not coming out right now is because I have to spread them apart a little bit. It's like last year when I was like planning for all these autumn patterns, and they all came out the same week in the end. And I was like, that's just terrible strategy, Ellie. What are you doing? So this is gonna come out sometime in December. You know, just like having a nice Christmas knit, essentially. If you want something a bit more laid back for yourself or someone else, whatever. It's nice and red in, in my version, so that's kind of what made me think it should come around out sometime this time of year. So without further ado, here we are. Okay. <laughs> This is the challenge with this uh, this camera, it's just, you get to see like sections of it, but uh, the full thing, I don't know. Hey, cardigan, I can put it on. 
it is after all my size because I knit all my samples in my size because uh, I want to wear them. So there. So, how about that? It doesn't have buttons on yet. That's because I just deked it the other day, thinking like yesterday morning. Uh, obviously I could have sewn on buttons before then, but I didn't. So, yeah. It's a very nice raspberry red. It comes across as a more Christmas red on here actually. But trust me on this, it has more pink to it than the camera may suggest. Maybe I should check on the white balance on this thing. I haven't really learned it yet, so yeah. It's a nice kind of roomy fit, but not. it's neither tight nor particularly loose. It doesn't really have any shaping either. It's just kind of a straight silhouette. Yeah, it is my usual, hang on, length. <laughs> It's a little bit longer than my usual length. My usual kind of goes to here and I decided to add just a bit to make it sit kind of right at the top of my hips. So it does actually work really well with cardigans, but I would obviously as ever say just knit it longer if you want it longer. It is so easy on this one, especially without the shaping, which I just didn't see as necessary here. It sits really well. <sighs> ah. So there. I actually, I can, oh, look at that, that looks really nice, doesn't it? I'm really happy with this pattern. I just signed it back in March. It's not a very fast craft, this. The whole profession really is quite a slow one. So you think you have stuff ready. Uh, but yeah, no, it takes always a bit longer than you think it is. So I started this in March and uh, uh, no, 1st of April, exactly 1st of April is when I cast on, but I just signed it in March and it's in Ravark ra <laughs> pronunciation. Uh, their sport weight merino from Bavaria, aka Bayern. Um, so it's a beautiful, beautiful yarn. Feels really nice. It's a little bit softer than the usual I use, but they still steek really well. You can see the it's a bit of a steek going on here. Yeah. It doesn't really add much bulk, I don't think. It's just like hidden behind the bottom band. I could tack it down as well and it would just sit alongside in here. I just don't care, personally. It's just like a small little thing. It's hardly that much more different than that little ridge you get when you pick up stitches anyway. So I don't, I'm don't. i not too fast. I said you can cast on seven stitches to do this, but if you really are super careful about the bulk, you can just cast on fewer, like, even down to three you could do, but five would be a nice compromise the inside floods as well pretty good look at that <laughs> this is the effect you get if you always hold the contrast color to the left it will look like this uh when i don't do that uh in the past for instance when i didn't i wasn't that careful with it it was just all over the place and you know what it's not the inside of your work so do you really care <laughs> anyway um so yeah this is I called it Nordbakan. I went through a lot of ideas for names. I even went to talk to one of my favorite authors online for, I talked to her before, it wasn't that weird, uh, <laughs> to ask if I could use the name of one of her characters, but then turns out that's actually a word she thought she'd made up, but it is also a word that translates to cardigan in a different language. So I was like, I can't call it the cardigan cardigan. So it is Nordbakan cardigan. Nordbakan basically, means north north hills uh bakke is a difficult word to translate from norwegian because hill is just the you know it's the hill uh a bakke is i guess the path up the hill it kind of suggests that something's going up or down there it's hillside but like if you're walking up the hill that would be walking up the bakke on the hill yeah, so anyway, Nordbakan just means the northern hill side. Uh, yeah, it's a family thing, you don't need to know the details. It's just kind of yeah, where my family used to live, um, my grandparents. So I just like the name. And yeah, people liked names with North in it, I guess. So. Hashtag Scandinavian. Hashtag never Higge. <sighs> don't get me started. <laughs> Uh -huh. Anyway, so there we have it. I don't think there's much else to say. It's just like one of those really nice stockinet breeze designs. Like I knitted this a lot up in in the Lake District where I just needed a bit of a stockinet to knit with the people there and you know being chatty and stuff. 
uh, is a really really lovely red um, again you can use the usual yarns that I recommend or you could use this particular yarn I like it and yeah I need to weave in the actual crochet reinforcement ends but all the other ends are woven in and it is ready uh, that was my phone if anyone's wondering uh, so yeah that's all I have to say finished object I'm really really proud I made like well in three days I had three finished objects and they were all garments and I thought wow that's that, that's one of the perks of having a million whips you actually sometimes end up finishing a lot and you feel very productive and then not even a dent has been made in your pile of whips. Nothing. It all looks like it's still a lot. <laughs> I do have one work in progress to show you. Um, it is in this bag that's made by Butternut Handmade UK, which I showed you. I showed you this last week, I think. It's a beautiful, beautiful bag, and I am just loving having this particular project in there because it's the same navy blue. I am basically working up on a Korsakoff to sweater. A bit more simplified, a bit simpler everything really. A bit more pullover, lighter. Yeah, it's not going to be done anytime soon. It might even be done until next year. So I probably shouldn't announce it, but it's just the thing that I decided to work on. So yeah, it's knitted in Exelana DK, so a lot lighter than the than uh, Pergint, but otherwise it's going to be made on the same gauge and it just feels really nice it will be yeah lighter simpler softer a bit more wearable it looks teeny tiny but the rib is quite elastic uh so it should be fine but i it is it is to the same dimensions as course but it looks so small and it looks like a night sky is that just me i feel like it looks like a night sky so that's what's living in here, which is one of those things that I pick up when I just want to knit on something very simple because knitting a lice pattern really is quite mindless. So I am enjoying that. And that's all I have for you guys this week. I haven't bought a thing, she says, looking at her new very fancy camera, bragging of not having anything in acquisitions. <sighs> yeah. So that, that's how that's going. Uh, nothing for acquisitions. Um, I think this episode's been going on for long enough. So I'm going to wrap it up here. And thank you all so much for watching. Hopefully not too... Uh, hopefully I will see you in not too long. And know how to talk by then. You know, but you never know. No guarantees. Uh, so yeah. Thank you all so much for watching. And I'll see you next time. Bye.